Krebs. Live from Twitch.tv, it's VTuber Talk. This week, our guest is Captain Krabs. It's all about to begin on VTuber Talk. Hello, and welcome to VTuber Talk. I'm your host, Jay, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. For those of you who haven't been here before, VTuber Talk is designed after classic late night talk shows. Everything here is live, casual, and the goal is to simply have fun conversations that will entertain people who are already familiar with the guest while still being accessible for new fans. That's my way of saying I hope that anyone can tune in and have a great time. As always, all cheers and donations are split 50-50 with the guest. Ah, <sighs> You know, one of the really cool things about running this show is that it forces me to go out of my way to find 
new and different VTubers. Um, just at the start, I, I knew that that would be an inevitability, but it's been a really fun experience for me as a whole just over these past now 13 weeks going around to different streams always trying to find new cool vtubers and goodness knows there are so so many more just amazing talented friendly vtubers than i will ever have the opportunity to interview but for me it means that i'm always just bouncing around in different streams and also having you know uh, circle back say hi to my previous guests and uh, it's a little bit hectic, but it's also a lot of fun. And one of the really cool things about VTubers and VTubing is just the sheer diversity of content and personalities and visuals. There's so, so much to see in the VTubing community. So if you're already in the community, even if you are already in the community, I definitely recommend go out of your way Try and find a few new VTubers, you know, just hop around, see if you can find someone that obviously, you know, you, you don't need to abandon your favorites, but uh, don't be afraid to explore a little bit. I think that's half the fun of all this and just being able to see and meet new people and uh, really appreciate the amazing efforts and uh, the creativity of everyone in the VTuber community. And uh, I certainly know... My guest tonight is one of the most creative VTubers I have seen. He is a DJ, he is an animator, he is many, many things, and I am so excited to have him on this evening. Please welcome my guest, Captain Krabs. Ahoy there, Captain. Thank you so much for being Ahoy. here this evening. How's it going? I'm doing great. Hopefully everything is coming through clear on the stream end. I always need to make sure that uh, the sound levels have been set using your awesome 8-bit background music. Hopefully the levels there are set as well. Please let me know, anyone in the chat, if uh, something's gone awry. We'll find out in a couple seconds, but in the <laughs> meantime, <laughs> I'm sure that plenty of the people in the audience tonight are already familiar with you, but... For those who might not be, please tell us a bit about you. It can be your lore, the type of content you're best known for, anything you think is important when getting to know Captain Krabs. Uh, well, I am a crab. Uh, that's that part's pretty obvious. I'm also a pirate captain. Uh, I like music, so I like and uh, live TD rigging. Uh, and sometimes play games, so I like chill, casual games. I'm also a wholesome uh, VTuber. I, they call it say so. I guess is the the term, the the jargon, as it were. It, yeah, just keep it kind of clean, you know. So, yeah, that, that's a best probably the best summary of me I could give you. <laughs> yeah, you've been really busy lately. You've been streaming more often than ever before. It seems lots of DJ streams, but you've also done you know uh, art nights, some party game nights. Uh, you've been really getting out there lately, and. Uh, you're, you've been also just actively making new models and a lot of different fun assets as you go. Oh, thank you, Chunky Supreme, for the follow. And thank you, the Argonon Bob, as well. Yeah, uh, lot, I, I, I don't know. I keep myself busy <laughs> as much as possible. And you, yeah. you seem to have quite the talent for it that uh, I know your day job is doing animation and whatnot, but is what you do by day the same type of animation that you've been doing when you're creating your different assets and outfits? Or is this a parallel skill set that you've just been developing as you go? Uh, a little bit of it, yeah. Um, and I do a lot more video editing uh, in my day job, um, but I do a lot of motion graphics as well. So it's a lot of After Effects, a lot of particle simulation. Uh, you know, premiere editing. Um, so there is a bigger editing uh, aspect to my day job than say what I do at night. But you know, like it, it's because of that that I ended up doing all my over all that stuff is kind of. Oop, one second, audio is cutting out here. Oh Maybe no! Discord has not been cooperating with us tonight. Hopefully things end up going okay. I'm double checking some things on my end, making sure that I don't have anything additional running i think we are good hopefully the connection holds out on us yes that's 
We should be okay. Well, fingers crossed. We will troubleshoot further if we need to. Okay. Hopefully, Discord's being weird tonight. <laughs> so, Can you hear me okay now, or yeah. is it still doing weird no, stuff? No, you're, okay. you're good now. So, I know that you did DJing streams prior to adopting your Captain Krabs persona, but that Captain Krabs was something that you had also prior to VTubing, if I understand correctly. Sort of. Uh, so, what it was, was uh, I used to DJ... Uh, with the cam uh, and do on a different channel um, and Captain Krabs came out of that in that I had an emote that I created that was with the crab um, and that little emote uh, ended up turning into what Captain Krabs is uh, to an extent uh, and it was made back first came out <laughs> so it was my little rave crab so kind of it kind of blent into what ended up being Captain Krabs in the end, but through a few revisions, there was a... Ah, oh no. Losing audio again. What's Are you... Going on? Hmm. I don't know. Not quite sure what's going on. Um... Ugh. We will continue to work through this. Thanks for being patient with us, folks. So, sorry, the last thing that I heard was that um, you went through some revisions in order to get to the Captain Krabs that we know and love today. So, was the first DJ Captain Krabs stream something of an experiment that then just you ended up rolling with? Or was it something that you consciously decided, all right, I'm going to try doing DJing as Captain Krabs and see, uh, you know, for an extended period of time how that goes? Uh, it was more of an experiment, really. I was like, oh, well, I wonder if I could actually DJ without any, you know, actual seeing someone actually doing it and if people would actually watch it. Well, I think we keep getting cut. I'm wondering if it's you getting cut when you're getting too loud. Oh. You might be okay, hold on. getting capped out there somewhere. Let me Let me try something here. One second. For me now? Yes, I can still hear you. A little bit more oh. reverb than there used to be, but I can definitely still hear you. I switched microphones to see if this one will cut out. Is it sound? Um, yeah, that one's cutting out worse. Ah. Sorry, folks. We did a sound test beforehand, and it was working then, and then just before we went live, his thing cut out for the first time and was like, oh, no. Hopefully, uh, doesn't become a thing, but, um, the forces of technology are conspiring against us this evening, so hang tight, everybody. Hmm. All right, sounds like you switched back to your initial mic. Yeah, this one, this one should be the one that's doing fine, but I don't know. I, the last few Discord problems with this, so... Uh, although this is a fresh fresh Windows install, so I shouldn't have any problems, but don't know. Okay, I wonder if there's something suppressing it if you get to a uh, like a peaking area of volume or something like that. Is there a setting in Discord for that? Because I don't and I, I wasn't sure. I'm checking now. I don't think so. Ah. Uh, Input sensitivity? Let's turn that off, see what that does. Possibly. Oh, uh, maybe, no maybe it was the lower end. That No, it might have been the lower end that was doing it, actually. That could have been it. Yeah, so decreasing the input sensitivity, hopefully that works out. As I always say, embrace the scuff, love the scuff. Scuff happens. <laughs> hopefully that'll fix it. Let me know if it does anything else. There's a bunch of different switches I can turn off. All right, you're sounding <laughs> a bit smoother so far, so... Fingers crossed that that did the trick. Anyways, okay. uh, where were we? So, I guess you said it was a bit of an experiment. Did you expect your uh, experiment to last one stream, two stream, or did you say, all right, I'm going to try this for a month? And at what point did you realize, okay, this is now becoming a thing? Um, I think I just kind of like, especially with the DJing, because I was doing, I was going to do some game streams and a little bit of art and kind of just, you know, whatever I felt like chill because i had gotten very stressed out 
uh, after about six years of streaming. Oh, that didn't do it. Nope. Nope. Uh, please stand by, folks. I'm actually going to check Discord status. Make sure there's not actual stuff going on on that. And weird. I have not had this problem with any of my previous guests. Let's see here. It says all systems operational. Hmm. And we spoke earlier in the weekend, didn't really have much trouble. I'm surprised that things are kind of yeah, fritzing out right now. Either. Well, we will just power through it. So, uh, yeah. yeah, so the the question was, uh, was there a particular moment where you realized, okay, people are really, you know, starting to get into Captain Krabs and starting to enjoy this? Um, I think it just, uh, like, I noticed that people would stick around during the DJ streams and were getting interactive and they were actually, like, you know, interacting with me and stuff and, and not just listening, but they're actually talking in chat. And I was like, oh, maybe this is actually something like people actually like this and they're having fun with it. And I was definitely happier, happier doing it that way than like the live DJing. Um, I don't know why. It's just I like the interaction. I, it's a nice change of pace. So I just kept going with it and kept. Yeah, I guess a lot of it when it comes to the interaction really comes to the fact that uh, you're able to sort of have bells and whistles as Captain Krabs that you wouldn't necessarily have as a conventional DJ and maybe there's also a part of it of just sort of the mental thing of looking at someone DJing and being like oh you know he's hard at work I don't want to bug him I don't want to distract him but when you see Captain Krabs just jamming out and you're able to bonk him or head pat him or have you become one of your many different forms that uh, uh, interaction is a bit more intuitive and uh, I guess there's a, a lessened mental barrier to it if that makes sense oh yeah yeah definitely uh, there's a lot more I, I, I'm all about interaction because uh, I'm uh, I, I just have a very short attention span so it's nice to interact and if I don't interact if like I'm streaming to 100 people and not a single person is talking I get really really bored so mm -hmm. I, I like to keep it, you know, I like to interact. And so a lot of DJs uh, you'll find, especially on Twitch, especially they, they don't even talk at all. It's like to listen to music. So they'll actually not really interact with the chat. They just kind of like they're putting on a show and people can talk, but that's about it, you know, like in the chat. And I, I'd rather talk and interact. So, yeah, that's an interesting uh, uh, sort of observation of DJing as a whole and I suppose that uh, it makes sense that uh, VTubers would be a bit more, well, VTubers and VTuber p fans would be more comfortable doing that just because it's sort of built into how we interact with people. Uh-oh. Captain, are you there? Yep, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I don't know what, I don't know what was going on there, but yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it's a uh... It's, it's different, you know, like I, I think some people actually stick around because it's different. They're they're used to DJing, DJs not really interacting, you know, and stuff. And, you know, there's always people that just want to listen to the music, you know. For sure. I, I'd rather have an, just a guy playing music because anybody could do that, you know. <laughs> so. Thank you to Golex Games and per Pirna for the follows. So you've been uh, continuing to iterate on Captain Krabs and all of your different designs just continuously. I know in the past week, you've not only made a new scene, but you've made a new outfit. You added a new reaction with the crab mallet. Uh, yep, yep. Do Tender you eyes. have... Yeah, <laughs> that, that is one of my favorites as just someone who enjoys eating crabs as a whole. That was particularly amusing to me along with the uh, hot tub scene that you created yeah they kind of went one together i was like i actually had more things planned i'll do 
Uh, thank you, Roshi Watches, for the follow. So when you're creating these, or rather, I suppose taking a step backward in that process, do you have a goal for yourself of, oh, I want to create a new thing every so often, and you sit down and try and think of something, or is it more spontaneous where just... If you think of something, you make it, and you might have a bunch of ideas one week, and maybe no ideas the next week. Yes. Uh, like, I'll actually have an idea, and then I'll be like, oh, I can do this over my lunch break. I think over my lunch break at work. Uh, I'm powered through. Bit of robot voice again? Well, it, the, hmm. so the issue is that it's not robot voice, it's just actually cutting out and also i just noticed that my auto mod censors the word crabs so i had to approve something <laughs> hi yami nice to see you <laughs> i don't know what's going on with discord i'm not i'm not actually hearing your side lagging at all so it's really weird that it's even doing anything and there's not and my system resources are like two percent so i don't know why it'd be cut now uh, try a different so Oh. Are you... Do you have a headset on, or do you have me coming out of a speaker? Headset. Okay. Because I noticed that uh, sometimes the audio issue would happen if the two of us were talking at the same time. I wasn't sure if that might have caused it, but that's probably not. Uh, we will continue to brainstorm and troubleshoot as we go, folks. Embrace the scuff, as always. So... You mentioned just, you know, doing these things over your lunch hour, so you're really fast at this if you're able to do this in such a short time. It, I guess that comes just from years of practice and doing all the different things that you've done. Yeah, I mean, I just, I like to run with ideas. So, like, like today I was like, wow, I'm going to make a, a new hairstyle because I wanted to, oh, you know, Iron Moss had done a raid, and I was like, yeah, let's just, let's just make a new hairstyle, and and I, you know, made an Iron Mouse costume. And there we go. I don't know. Hey. <laughs> you know, and uh, I, I don't know. I just, like, come up with an idea, and then I make it right away. And if I don't make it, I'll write it down, and then it'll never be made. Usually what happens. So. Mm. That's everywhere. Up to, up to never do. <laughs> so, yeah, my brain runs uh, at the speed of light a lot of times. And if I don't do it right away, I don't do it. So I have to like make lists and then try to do them, and you know it just depends. Like whatever, if I'm really passionate about something right away, it's much quicker, uh, and I can get it done pretty quickly. So I think the Iron Mouse thing took about two hours. The the costume one, <laughs> about two hours. Her hair, she's got a lot of hair. Yeah, and the little boingy curl plus the tail and the uh, ribbon. Yeah, I think there's like eight different uh, physics things going on in this hairstyle right now. Still, all that in just two hours, that's still extremely impressive. Yeah, I think the drawing took an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good at hair. <laughs> that's why I'm a crab with no hair. Ah, the secret. Best way to avoid having to animate hair. Don't have any. Yeah, it's much easier. Much, much easier. <laughs> So you obviously have a background in animation, and DJing, it seems, was sort of a side passion. One. Whoop, sorry, um, the, the first few words of that got cut off. Sorry. Um... Yeah, so it basically started because I wanted another hobby because I didn't have enough hobbies as it already was um, that didn't involve what I did, which is like video. And I was like, well, I like audio. And I, at one point, used to try to produce audio and music and stuff a long time ago. But uh, I was like, oh, I like DJing, you know. I love watching DJs. And, and I was Ah, we're still losing you, Captain. Ah, oh, man. One second. I'm going to try... Bear with me, folks. I, I want to see if... If I cut the... The screen share feed... Captain, stop the screen share feed just for a second. That If we have to do this radio style, we will see. Yeah. Um, let's experiment with this for a little bit. See if it improves things. 
Sure, no problem. All right, yeah. so... Um, sorry. Uh, retracing thoughts, where were we? Uh, Iron Mouse, Hair Physics, DJing. Uh, that time you cut out. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, okay. Um, yes. Uh, what was I talking about? Physics? Uh, DJing and uh, how that oh. started out as a, an outlet to do things that was different from your day job. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I, I bought this little uh, mixer. It was like a little... They actually... It's like a... I don't know how to explain it. It's like a four-inch tall little wide mixer board that sits on a laptop. And I was like, I'm just gonna DJ on my laptop, like you know, songs, like not not anything heavy, just kind of like make my own playlist kind of thing, while I game, so I can have my own music. This is obviously before DCMAs were a problem. Um, you know, this is probably four years ago. Um, but uh, I was like, ah, I'll just dabble in that. And then I started getting really into it, where I just started doing nights where I was only DJing, and then you know, it kind of went from there. And then I then I had moved from Twitch to Mix. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know what? There's like only three DJs on all of Mixer. And I started DJing more and more, got really into it. And then Rip Mixer. Yeah, two years. Two years. That was a. Nope. Audio issues are still there. Captain. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you now. I don't know what's going on. I'm not. I'm not even seeing anything spiking on my. Whoop. I I do not know. I have not had this issue in any of my previous shows. Um. Uh, okay, I do have one way we can fix this, maybe, but it involves me plugging some other things in. So give me one second. Okay, please stand by, folks. Um, yeah. But we won't be able to do the model. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Ah, the joys of live production. Can't live with it, can't live without it. Anyways, for those of you in the chat, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. I uh, do this show every Friday. It's been usually... Uh, sometimes I will have the show on Saturday, depending on the time zone of my guest. I've had a few European guests and uh, doing things at 9 p.m., on for Eastern Standard Time does not necessarily work for European, but uh, it's usually Friday or Saturday evenings. This is my 13th show. I've been doing one a week, and it's been a lot of fun. I'm really excited to be talking to Captain Krabs tonight. Hopefully we'll be able to figure out this audio issue. Uh, we spoke earlier in the week and didn't have anything like this, so hopefully we get all this ironed out. But uh, we'll get back with you as soon as we can. I do recognize a blue, sorry, a gamer blue stream in the chat. You're one of the mods for Captain Krabs. Thank you for coming along with us tonight. And I saw Yami for a minute there in the chat. You just got your purple check mark. Congratulations, my friend. That's so exciting. I'm so just happy for you that uh, you and Phoebe both have had uh, quite the week getting partner. Whoop. Something just changed. That's my logo, but being distorted in purple. Oh, I bet I know what happened. Yep. All right, I'm the captain. Will be back in just a minute, folks. In the meantime, I will continue to vamp. For those of you in the chat, uh, oh, one second. Let's go to that. Captain, are you there? I am not hearing you if you are there. We will figure this out. Ah, probably just a microphone setting that needs to be switched out. Anyways, uh, for those of you in the chat, let me know how did you discover Captain Krabs? Uh, were you raided into him were you looking around for a dj how'd you end up meeting the captain or is this your first time learning about him tonight hmm 
Mousy, yeah. It seems that uh, her VTuber deep dive has actually gotten the captain a fair bit of uh, fan support uh, from her community that uh, she rated him, I think, for the second, possibly third time it was last night. It's uh, really cool to see that uh, her fans have really taken to the captain, and uh, it it's sort of funny. That's not how I found out about Captain Krabs myself, but I found out about him around the time of his second raid from uh, Iron Mouse because uh, I was raided into him from another VTuber. I can't remember. It was either Prayers from Abigail or it might have been Phoebe who was on my show previously. Oh, Roshi Watches found out through Mama Vale. Alrighty. Hopefully the captain will be rejoining us again very soon. Once again, thank you all so much for joining us on this uh, wonderful Friday evening been another crazy, crazy week in the world of VTubers. Speaking of VShojo, they just announced that they have a new member. Um, I'm going to remind myself the proper way to pronounce her name, Vebe. That Vebe is now a member of VShojo. Uh, apparently, she has actually done collaborations with them in the past, so this isn't entirely out of left field or anything, but it's always cool to see that... Uh, these groups are just, you know, growing and that uh, people are able to learn about new things. Uh, the uh, Hololive uh, uh, second group, as they called it for uh, Hololive EN, concluded recently. They said that they don't actually plan to do generations for Holo EN as they did for the Japanese branch. But uh, the second round has concluded, so it'll be interesting. My guess is we'll probably end up seeing them joining the roster sometime in July, August, September, if I had to guess, because they're probably in the middle of doing their rounds of auditions right now, and then once they, you know, narrow down the group, they have to get paperwork signed, and then they actually have to do all the work to get, you know, models and whatnot created, and then assets rigged, and make sure that everyone is all set and ready to go, plus they probably do some rehearsals in between. But, uh, it'll be very exciting to see that group expand once again. That, uh, whoop. Back to the purple it goes. It was funny, uh, the captain was actually telling me just before we went live about Mama Vale and that he did her model. I did not actually realize that because I'm, I was not super familiar with Mama Vale, but that's really cool that, uh, the captain has uh, that sort of tangential relation. Uh, Aha! So can you hear me now? I can hear you now. There's a bit of background noise, but, uh, we will work with it. Yeah, I uh, literally had to plug a, into a different computer, so hopefully this works. We'll see if this causes the same problems or not, but... Fingers crossed. Uh, one second, the... Okay, I'll turn on noise suppression here and see what happens. Yeah, alrighty, and I'm just lowering down the audio on our end because you're a bit hotter here. Uh, folks in the chat, let me know if the captain is coming through clearly and if the levels are all right. Alrighty, so let's see here. Where were we? And uh, thank you so much, Captain, for uh, working with me and, uh, you know, retooling things on the fly like this. So sorry that uh, this ended up happening. Oh, no problem. I don't I don't know what's going on, so it's kind of weird. Yeah. Well, anyways, well, now that all that is over and done with, um, <laughs> let's see here. Retracing where we So, yes, DJing. So you ended up becoming, uh, you were telling me about the last of your time on Mixer. Did you end up becoming one of, you know, 10 or 20 DJs on there, or was the DJ scene, DJ scene still on the smaller side when things shut down? Uh, I think in the end there was maybe eight DJs. Um, okay, so still a niche market. Oh, yeah. Well, and Mixer wasn't... I mean, it, it had a lot of people, but it wasn't anywhere near levels of Twitch. You know, like, Twitch was still um, just ridiculously, you know, bigger. Um, but uh you know it, it just kind of like it, it whoop, hold on a second um ooh, what was that um sorry anyways um yeah it was a uh, it was still a niche market but there was i mean we were getting you know like 50 to 60 people and they're watching you know the streams and stuff like that so it wasn't like super super low um it still was a pretty good you know size group of people and stuff so now it's kind of uh... cool 
Was it particularly complex to port things over when Mixer shut down, or were you able to get things shifted over relatively easily? And thank you, Raymond Dawes, for the follow. And uh, oh, Sorashima VTuber, I missed you as well. Thank you for the follow. Um, well, so I actually came back to my original channel, which is not the Captain Krabs channel. So when I came back from Mixer, because that was uh, February of last year. Uh, so I think it was like I went back and I was just miserable and I was thinking about quitting streaming. I wasn't enjoying it. And then I just kind of like stopped streaming a lot and just every once in a while. And then, uh, you know, like I started watching more VTubers because VTubing was starting to pick up. Um, I think I created the account in July, but I didn't really start streaming until um, August um, when I finally made a character and stuff. And and it, I don't know, it just was something about it was just like really cool to see, you know, like it just kind of picked up suddenly. And I don't know, it just it, it, I, I came in right at the right time when VTubing was just starting to get really big on Twitch, especially. Mm. Yeah, it definitely sounds like it was a right place, right time situation. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, it was like and it started picking up and there's a lot of VTubers. I mean, now there's an insane amount of VTubers, but it was more of a YouTube thing than a Twitch thing. Yeah. You know, before, like, I, I think October was like the big month when it started picking up last year. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, because that was about the time that whole live English came out and really just galvanized the entire community. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, uh, it just started picking up and it was kind of crazy and you know, it was nice to be there for the ride kind of thing, you know? So, uh, Golex Games in the chat has a question of, uh, would you say being a VTuber is worth it as a job in terms of return for profit and uh, community support? Now, obviously, you have a full day job, so this is not necessarily what you're trying to make your 9 to 5, but uh, I guess the essence of the question here is, uh, are you... Are you feeling like you're getting back what you're putting into all this? And I I would hope the answer is yes, because you're still doing it and feels like you've been increasing the amount of time you've been de dedicating to it over the past couple weeks. Um, so the reason, and I'll tell you right off the bat, uh, and I've, you know, besides um, streaming for almost seven years total, I've also ran streams for game companies and stuff like that so i've seen a lot of the like back end you know dealing with twitch and dealing with that stuff um and unless you're a very very successful streamer the amount of money you'll make each month uh is not a lot so depending on your cost of living it can make a huge swing on whether it's worth going full-time or not um because you can't you can't judge your your income on what some of the really huge streamers that get you know, 20,000 subs a month are going to be like, because that's For sure. like yeah, less than 0.5% of all yeah, streamers. That, that is a statistical anomaly. Yeah. So, and I have, uh, you know, a wife and two kids. And so to support a family, full-time streaming, it's just not going to cut it. So like, that's why I keep my day job. Now, if for some reason, it just was insane, exploded, and I was making you know, 10,000 subs a month where it would be like viable to, you know, quit my day job, maybe then I would consider it. But, <laughs> you know, otherwise it's like every, every, everything that gets, you know, like every sub and everything else that I get, it goes right back into the stream, you know? So it's, it's kind of nice to like supplement that income, but it's not the reason I stream. Yeah. You know, I just want to have fun. I want to, I want to socialize, especially in these times where, a super social person like me being stuck inside 24 7 and not seeing people yep that is, is uh, a good chunk of the reason why i started this show <laughs> yes so you know that that is a, a main reason for it but also um you know it, i just have i just wanted to have fun like i i tried doing streaming uh because i work in games and and game industry is flaky so i've been you know through layoffs and stuff like that and um you know it there's ups and downs on it all of it so like at the same time i'm like i tried full-time streaming at one point you know and it just wasn't i couldn't you know i just couldn't pull it off and i i like streaming and i'd probably stream more you know obviously if i wasn't you know if i was unemployed but <laughs> so you know it's just it's just it's fun for me right now and that's really what i want out of it so yeah and uh, i i definitely think that if you're not actually trying to well 
I think in general, streaming needs to come from a place of fun and passion, that you need to be really enjoying what you're doing, that honestly, in any entertainment industry, whether it be gaming or streaming or Broadway or something like that, that these are industries of passion where you need to be enjoying what you do, otherwise uh, you're not going to have a good time. But speaking right, of right. your day job, so you're in the gaming industry now, but you mentioned to me that a lot of your love of gaming traces back to some MMOs that you were really into back in the day, and that MMO gaming was sort of your bread and butter, even if you don't play as much nowadays, that uh, that was really sort of your core as a gamer. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, I grew up on all the consoles, and I was alive for all of them. Um, not to date myself, but, uh, you know, like, I played a lot of console games, but we didn't have internet in the small town I grew up in until, after, until I got to college. So, like... I didn't actually, you know, experience anything until uh, the first game, uh, the first MMO I ever got into was Ultima Online. And I was logging, you know, 48 hours straight in that game without, you know, with just bathroom breaks and food. You know, like I was just like spending all my time quit, you know, like quit college, you know, like I was just like hardcore into it. And then, you know, like I've hardcore played so many MMOs. I just loved it. Like it was social, which I love, you know, it kept my attention. There was always something new to do. You know, I got really into it, um, and uh, you know, I played a lot of games, and and which eventually led to me working in the game industry in the end. So, um, because of the the videos I made in Star Wars Galaxies, so, so got me hired. So it was started yeah. as a, a fan project that then led to it. So, what were these videos in Star Wars Galaxies? And thank you, Krillkin, for the follow. Yep. One second, I'm I'm hearing myself now. Oh, your audio has actually been coming in very clearly ever since you made the mic switch, so that seems to have done the trick for what it's worth. One, one second, I just got to figure out why, uh, oh. Sorry, I was hearing, I was hearing myself for some reason, mm. so I'm, I'm trying to kill it off. Oh, well, I guess I'm just going to hear myself. I don't know what's going on with that. Ah. <laughs> Did you maybe turn a monitor on or something? I think... St oh, Steam Steam started streaming. That's weird. That's interesting. Go home, Steam. Right. You're drunk. I killed it. I killed it. Okay. There we go. Mind. Success. <laughs> Yay. So, yeah, oh, that so was really weird. <laughs> <laughs> so Star Wars Galaxies videos. So what were these? Um. So... The back history on them was there's a dancing profession in Star Wars Galaxies. There was a musician and dancing. You could level up and just be a dancer. And they had these very kind of silly dances that you could do. Um, and so I started making videos like dance music videos for my guild as a joke. Well, then they like started picking up. Um, they had this fan fest, which is like a Sony's fan fest where they like, you know, thing. And I guess they showed one of my videos in front of like 15,000 people to this fan fest. And then it just like started picking up. And then I did one called Fets Vet, which was for a uh, uh, nerdcore rapper, MC Chris, um, back when he was first starting out. Mm. And that video just exploded on the internet. And uh, like about four years later, um, Bioware Austin formed um, and the two Sony execs that worked on Galaxies formed the Austin studio. And uh, when I came in for the interview, they hired me on the spot because they knew who I was right off the bat. Hey, there <laughs> yeah. you go. So also, it was uh, kind of crazy that this little stupid hobby of mine uh, got me my first game job. So kind of kind of crazy, kind of crazy times. Hey, but. it's a small world and a smaller injury. Sorry, <laughs> small world and a smaller industry. Goodness. Also, uh, <laughs> injury, Renpona, yeah. thank you for the raid. Yep, it really is. It really is. So, uh, you have that basis in animation, and uh, that's what you do now, and you've worked on a lot of different things. Um, mm -hmm. That uh, initial Star Wars Galaxies machinima basically led to you actually working on Star Wars itself. Uh, a little bit, yes. I worked on, I worked on Star Wars The Republic. Um, yeah, uh, Star Wars Republic. That was the that was the main game Star Wars game I worked on. About four years on that game, I helped ship that game. It was really cool. Um, 
I, I loved working there. That was great. That was that was my first game job. It was Bioware. It was Star Wars. It was two things I was super, super passionate about. So it was kind of a, a crazy start to the whole thing. Um, you know, and since then, I've been at a bunch of other companies, but it's, uh, you know, it's still got a, a soft spot in my heart, you know, for that <laughs> initial one, you know, so it was kind of crazy. So uh, I guess, what was it like for the first couple of weeks or months working there and sort of realizing, oh, gosh, this is real? Oh, man, it was it was kind of crazy. Before that, I was actually doing web design for about 10 years, um, and I was kind of sick of it because the weird thing about web design is that every year there's some new programming language that is the the thing and everybody's like oh you know ajax is the cool language now every website needs to be an ajax or whatever it was and i was just sick of learning new languages every year because the coding wasn't the part i enjoyed it was the graphics so mm -hmm. like i learned to code so i could do full websites you know i'd write back ends and and be able to run them you know like and um actually a little offshoot on that which is kind of funny uh, the first thing I learned to code was in Perl, uh, and it was a desktop app that would generate an entire website. And oh, I was wow. drawing an, yeah, I was drawing an online comic for about three years. I drew an online comic. Uh, I'm not the greatest writer, but I, I had a lot of fun drawing it. Um, but I had to literally manually make each page for that site at the time. And so I learned to code so I could make a script that would just take all the images in one folder and generate the entire all website the with back forward buttons yeah, and random. Yeah, because back in the day of when you would need to do that and create a new page for each of it, and heck, some sites still yes. have to work with that uh, style of technology and just sort of storage nowadays. That's really cool. Exactly. So you've always just been the type to you know, build your own stuff, whether it be... Uh, script or website or in this case a vtuber and then his 10 friends i think he's up to now yeah yeah it's it's i always learn by doing so like even when i was learning web uh i learned by looking at source codes of other people's sites so yeah, like i was never it. good at yeah i was never good at like somebody trying to tell me how to do it with my hardcore like strong adhd i just don't have the focus power and so it was easier for me to like tried to break it down in my brain on my own. Um, and that's how I learned video editing as well and motion graphics and everything else. You know, it was like, I learned by doing much easier. So I like to give myself a project, you know, like something mm -hmm. like Captain Krabs. That was my project. I was like, ooh, this is fun. I, I need to learn how to rig these myself. You know, so I reverse engineered a live 2D rig and learned how to do it. You know, watched a few tutorials on YouTube. Um, those don't always help me, but at least I can figure out some things from those. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, and just kind of like figure it out, you know, like slowly but surely. So it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely the way my brain works. Uh, it's a, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a process I had to learn to do, you know, on my own stuff. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that sort of skill set has spiraled into a lot of different things because you've not only done animation, but you've done compositing, you've done VFX, you've done uh, just, so many different aspects of visual work for gaming and also for animation as well. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, um, I th I'm trying to think. Like, uh, I mean, I did compositing uh, for some films and TV for a few years. That was a lot of fun. Um, it's not fun uh, if you have a family because it's all contract work, mm -hmm. <laughs> so you get no benefits. Uh, that's actually why I left it. It was my wife got pregnant and. Uh, and uh, we're like, yeah, we're not going to raise a kid in Hollywood or nope. Hollywood. And, and nope, uh, nope. the co cost of living is super high. You don't know if your project's going to end and you have to find work and you have no backups, no insurance, <laughs> you know, like all that stuff. So we're like, I need a full time job. So I went back into gaming where they have fairly good benefits uh, overall and, you know, a lot of family support a lot of times. So, um, you know, like that maternity leave <laughs> and paternity leave. Um, so yeah, that we we uh, we actually ironically, my wife's six months pregnant. We drove from Hollywood to Baltimore. Oh my the gosh, entire that's, country. Yeah, I was about to say yeah. it, there aren't many places you could go to and from and have it be farther than that. Yeah, we literally went coast to coast, uh, but the doctor was like, "If you're gonna drive, now is the time <laughs> before yeah. she gets any more pregnant." Mm -hmm. um, 
because we're, I took a job at ZeniMax working on Elder Scrolls Online, and it was a really good paid job. They gave me Hollywood pay, which is awesome, plus benefits, and they had a great benefit package. So we're like, let's take it. We need it. You know, like we're, we can't afford this kid in Hollywood. So, <laughs> so it was, a, you know, like a life decision. We, I, you know, moved to six different states, I think. The game industry is ups, ups and downs. So you never know if you're going to get laid off or move on to something else, if uh, something is going under. Or... So you just kind of have to roll with it. But, you know, like it's a uh, it's I still enjoy it. I still enjoy the industry. So yeah. I've done the drive from Dallas to Maryland, which is about half the country. And that took I think it was three and a half days ish. We stopped at one point to see some family at about the halfway point for like half a day or something but uh otherwise it was you know a good three days just driving how long was that road trip from hollywood to baltimore um it was let's see it was we took it i think we did it in seven days but we also took our time we could have powered mm. through it and probably made it in like four maybe yeah but at the same time um, but... if you're making that type of a trip you might as well make a trip out of it oh yeah and i didn't want to like you know I figured it was just we, we even like swung up to see our parents, you know, like we were just like, we're going to take our time. You know, my wife ended up driving most of it because she was pregnant and she didn't feel sick when she was driving. Mm. So <laughs> it, was it, like, was... it was better for her to drive than to actually try to, you know, actually uh, not, you know, like be the rider. So mm. it, it was kind of all over the place with that. But it was a lot of fun, though. I mean, I think overall we enjoyed it and it was a nice change of pace and definitely a but... road trip for the memory. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so when it comes to animation, uh, I suppose backtracking a little bit, you mentioned to me that you were a big fan of anime in the day, that you don't necessarily have time to watch anime as much nowadays, but that it, you used to watch a fair bit. Do you think that watching anime or just watching cartoons in general growing up, uh, do you feel that had any impact on your desire to become an animator yourself? Um, yeah, I mean, I watched anime even in high school, uh, maybe early middle school, too. Um, you know, I really got into it. I mean, oh man, I, I really date myself by saying this, but, you know, this is back when you couldn't rent anime. Uh, you couldn't watch it online. So you actually had to buy it from like a Suncoast video. Ah, uh, Suncoast <laughs> and, uh, video. Good yeah, times. Man, I miss it. I miss it. But, you know, it was a it was kind of you just randomly look at you know boxes of anime and be like what is this you know like it really wasn't and we had no internet at the time so you just kind of you know found things had, like and I think you had to trust what it said on the back of the box and hope it wasn't something that was being misrepresented or you know not accidentally I, uh, buying uh the, the adult <laughs> anime shall we say i have a funny story about that <laughs> oh no <laughs> So, uh, one of the first animes I ever bought was from Suncoast, which didn't sell adult anime at the time, supposedly. Uh, and I, I don't remember the name of it. I think it was called Magical Twilight. It was like a box set of this. Oh, yep, it was yep, be out. yep. Gamer Blue yeah, Stream literally just put in the chat, ask him about Magical yeah. Twilight. Yeah, so it was like a box set. On the back of the box, nothing pornographic. It was like just magical like witches it kind of looked like little witch academia or something right oh, and yeah. uh, little witch academia is yeah. super wholesome love that series yeah and nothing nothing dirty about it at all and suncoast i don't even think knew it was they probably had no idea that. what the heck they were buying and stocking but i mean we were like in maybe high school maybe middle school still at that time and bought that and started watching and we're like oh, oh. this is anime this is what anime is. <laughs> oh like, no yeah, I was like, wow, okay, yeah, um, yeah, let's go back to Suncoast, see what else they got. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like I watched, I got into all the major ones, you know, like Trigun and Cowboy Bebop mm. and Slayers was a really big one for me. I love Slayers. Um, I mean, there was a lot of Tenchi Mew back then, you know, like, and uh, still my favorite animes are probably like the 80s, 90s animes, to be honest. Um, you know, I, I try to watch newer animes, um, when I was uh, at Rooster Teeth, uh, one of the things that was really big at the time was um, My Hero. What's it? My Hero uh, Academia. My Hero. Yeah, right. Is that the one with the. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it was really big, and they were using it as a basis for some of this combat and Ruby. 
Um, and so like everybody was talking about it every day. So I was like, oh, I got to watch this and stuff. And I got about a season and a half in before I got bored, to be honest. But um, I tried to watch a lot more anime back then, you know, so it was like, uh, you know, because it was like a reference thing. And I even watched some Yu-Gi-Oh, which I'd never watched before. Oh, wow. Um, I've watched Yu-Gi-Oh yeah. when I was younger. Uh, have not watched it in a long time, but uh, that's uh, one of the ones. Uh, I suppose I didn't grow up with it, but that was definitely one of the ones that I watched when I was like, you know, a teenager or early teens. So fond memories yeah, there, that, even if going back and watching it, it's like, oh, this is not a particularly good show. Yeah, isn't that the, the thing with Yu-Gi-Oh and like Pokemon and all that stuff was it was towards the end of my high school run. Mm. So I wasn't really into it at the time. I was into other things, you yeah, know, yeah. like real life things more than like watching stuff. You know, I got back into anime later on, but it was not my main focus at the time mm -hmm. so um you know like uh so i kind of missed the whole pokemon like to this day i've only played two pokemon games ever uh, that was pokemon snap on the n64 hey the and... new pokemon snap is coming out next month actually no yeah, i think it's coming out this month it's this month end of this month end of this month i think 25th or 6th or something yeah soon and uh pokemon go i played a little bit because mm. everybody at work was playing it yeah yeah but other than that like i didn't really i never played another pokemon i still haven't i never played anything Yu Gi Oh or ever watched anything Yu Gi Oh. but there was a scene in ruby that they wanted me to emulate something from Yu Gi Oh. are you able to say what that uh, scene was because i have act i'm actually a pretty big ruby fan i've seen all of uh volume 8 which just concluded a couple weeks ago and now yeah. i'm I'm curious to know if I can, you know, sort of mentally see where you got these parts from. So uh, which scene was it? Sure. So nobody judged me on this one. Yu-Gi-Oh! is the one with the pyramid necklace, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> Don't okay. worry. I just want to make sure, make sure I'm saying the right anime here. You're good. You're uh, good. Okay. So there was a scene when you first see Oscar's semblance um, when he does spoiler alert Os ospin's kind of like mm. transformation between him and ospin it's a, like they're in like a house and he transforms and stuff and they wanted me to emulate the Yu-Gi-Oh transformation and so I actually made it look like the Yu-Gi-Oh oh transformation my gosh. so a and, and i guess the cane else, yeah. i guess ospin's cane would have been the puzzle in this analogy mm -hmm. yep. oh my gosh i need to go back that and watch that scene like now that. <laughs> in the rough cut like edit like the animatic that was the scene so it was just like this do this and i'm like oh i better start looking into yugi because i've never seen it um hey so it's got to be fun when you're just... told uh go watch anime on the clock oh yeah well and carrie shawcross the he's one of the writers and creators he um he's a hardcore Yu Gi Oh fan so of course mm -hmm. that's and my hero academia he was that's why there was so much integrated in that show from it yeah yeah because he was just so hardcore into it but um yeah it was um but yeah that scene i emulated Yu-Gi-Oh. <laughs> i have to go back and find that scene I that's can't incredible what scene like that that's the type well, of stuff that uh, like sometimes only sometimes gets onto like the director's cut commentary uh, i mm -hmm. i live for those types of cool little details uh yeah that's so neat uh you were also telling me about um there was a particular scene in volume three where you actually sort of created a new set of animation. I, I don't know what the proper terminology here would be, if it would be like a new asset or a new um, uh, a new visual style isn't the right word, but uh, you mentioned... Effect? Uh, yeah, a new VFX for mm -hmm. when Adam Taurus uses his semblance because it was something that hadn't been done mm -hmm. in Maya yet, so you had to recreate a particular scene sort of from scratch and... I suppose now yeah. this makes sense with how you've been talking about your tendency to reverse engineer things for web mm -hmm. code for VTubers that in this case you reverse engineered a VFX. Yeah, so Monty Elm, the original creator of Ruby, had done the effect and he, he actually did it as a uh, in um, Blender, or not Blender, uh, Poser, a mixture of Poser, um, I think it was 3DS Max actually, for the particles and then he did after effects for the actual post work on it the color correction yeah yeah um and so i ended up just recreating that whole effect in after effects 100 percent. so everything in there is after effects the particles everything um and so because that's where you know like i don't 
I don't really do. I went to school for 3D, but I don't touch 3D, to be <laughs> honest. Uh, you know, I went to school for it and I haven't touched it since uh, because I got more into the post work stuff. I love generating particles in After Effects. Mm -hmm. I love like doing the compositing, the color, the, you know, all that stuff. And, and so I was like, I can do all that in After Effects. And so I was able to recreate that that look and, and update it a little bit because it, you know, it was a little dated at that point. So. Yeah, I make it look a little more detailed and, you know, like uh, like I actually have in the background, uh, Monty had like all these particles coming up, but I made it where you can actually see the, the uh, furniture in the background that's lifting up is actually coming apart in particles. So if you look in the background, you can kind of see the particles coming off all the furniture because it's actually in that effect is kind of disintegrating. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like little details like that, like it's, it's fun stuff to do. It's just you, you know, like you obviously have to go with what the director wants, but you know, they, on that one, they were just like, recreate this. <laughs> can you recreate this? I'm like, yes, I can. <laughs> so, you know, like, I'm like, I can, th I can do that. That's not a problem. So, um, you know, and there was a lot of scenes like that where they were like, they kind of, once they, once they realized I knew how to do all this stuff, um, it was more like they just kind of let me go with it, which was nice. Mm. Uh, a lot of the people there are straight out of college, so they don't have experience. I would say like 95% of the staff have no real world experience. They're straight out of college. Um, so they've never done this stuff. So they don't know how to like think through it. You know, like yeah. somebody has to show them how to do it. Whereas you came um, in, uh, you know, packing all these years uh, of experience. So yeah. uh, not even the management is used to having someone of your caliber but at the same time, you're able to discover things yourself just because you're more adept at it. Yeah, I was I was part of like the first wave of hiring some people with experience. Um, they were they were struggling with that because of costs. You know, mm. they didn't want to pay someone the wages they were getting in Hollywood in Texas. You know, and nobody wanted to take the job otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> so it was it was tough, and even I took a, a massive pay cut to work there at the time because I was just excited about the project. You know, like I really liked Ruby, and I was like, oh, I can take a pay cut for now, and you know, uh, maybe things will shape up later. And um, unfortunately, it didn't. But <laughs> well, maybe it didn't <laughs> you know, shape up with that particular project, but. Uh things have shaped up in your career as a whole it certainly seems that uh oh yes you, yeah, you've, yeah. Gone no, through, more you've gone through the ringer in more ways than one but uh you come out on top in the end oh yeah and i enjoyed working on the project you know like it just you know when you support a family you gotta of course make yeah. a living wage for sure, for sure. <laughs> so, Do you so still... it, was fun. it was fun two years and yeah. you know moved on but hmm. um still you know has a you know i still love that project and you know i miss working on it too so it's, it was fun do you keep up with Ruby or just, I suppose, in general, do you find yourself keeping up with projects that you have work on, worked on after you leave the project? Because I know having, you know, I only have had one job in the gaming industry thus far, and I mm -hmm. have, I very quickly noticed my gaming consumption plummet. Because yeah. when you're working on something from nine to five, it's not even that you dislike it, it's that you want a bit of a change of pace. But then also, I can absolutely see how if you are intimately involved with a pro with a production or a project that once you've left it, regardless if you left on good terms or bad terms, that going back to it might be a little bit weird because it's like uh, sometimes it's you know flying too close to the sun that uh, you know a bit too much about the back end things and that it, you're not able to just enjoy it anymore because you're involuntarily even thinking about the nitty-gritty of it all uh do you find yourself it, having that struggle so, or are you able to separate it mentally especially in games i definitely know a lot of people that don't play games once they started working in games um it's more of like a time thing a lot of times but yeah i i didn't really affect my gameplay having kids affect my gameplay very fair <laughs> so, uh, but uh and it wasn't that i didn't want to play games and stuff like that and i you know i still do i just end up going more casual games that i can pick up and play and mm. stop on a, a whim you know like yeah, yeah. you know like minecraft or stardew valley or something but um it, it didn't affect it the only thing was that probably got the most effect was working in hollywood and doing post work because i cannot turn off my brain when i watch a movie and oh so it's not I even cannot... it's not even a particular project or franchise it's just holistically when you're watching films now 
your brain I goes into that mode. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll be like, oh, I can see their green screen lines. You know, like I can, I can totally see where they messed up or, oh, that CG doesn't look very good. I would have composited that differently. <laughs> you know, I mean, I still enjoy it. Don't get me wrong. I love movies and it's not that hard to please me. We'll put it that way. You know, I, I love movies that are really dumb sometimes. Like, uh, hey, uh, but after years of me. training to be technical, but, yeah. your brain flips to technical. Oh, yeah. And the, the thing was, my wife uh, actually went to the same college I did for 3D animation. So she had some of this post work. She didn't end up doing it for a living, but she knows like how this stuff is put together, too. So we end up just judging the movies <laughs> effects the entire time. So we're just like, you know, like, oh, oh, man, did you see that green screen line? Oh, yeah, I really saw that, man. Well, that I suppose if nothing else, it gives you something to bond over. And thank you, Raymond Dawes, oh, yeah. for the raid. Yeah, it's it's kind of like that. And, you know, like, it, it's not that we, like, are judging the movie like, I hate this movie because they messed up on the effects. No, it's more it, of it's, just... It's an uh, amusement thing. Oh, there's things I've seen that I can't unseen, though, in movies. You're just like this big blockbuster movie, and you're like, oh, man, that looked bad. Like, why is his foot slipping? <laughs> you know, I noticed his foot slipping. No one else noticed it, but I noticed it, and now I can't unsee it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, uh, oh. just... When you get into that type of technical thing, and it's just, I'm not able to detect that type of thing for films, but it's the type of thing that uh, I played music for a while, so I have mm -hmm. a bit of a sharper ear than most, and I'm able to detect some more subtle things. Uh, <laughs> same thing in just, you know, other quirky aspects, but, uh, you know, when you have a specialty, it makes sense that you're more attuned to it, and that you're able to detect these things, and... Uh, that's really cool. I, I suppose it might be a little <laughs> bit annoying, but it, it's still neat, I suppose, that you and your wife have been able to, you know, sort of bond over that and enjoy that together, that it's not just one of you saying, oh, gosh, I see that thing, and the other doesn't, that you're both like, did you see that? Oh, yeah, I totally saw that. Oh, yeah. Well, and, <laughs> and you know, it's not even just, like, VFX stuff. Like, I can judge a movie by the, the way it's written and the, the timing, especially editing, because that's what I've been doing for 15 years. So, like, I, I you know, like, Gamer Blue's trying to, egg me on right now because he knows the rant the game lose my real life twin brother um he uh, knows my rant about the justice league snyder cut yeah i <laughs> i saw that ign posted a thing saying that apparently 10 percent of that film uh, at least of the snyder cut was in slow-mo i have not seen the snyder cut but i saw that stat and that's just yeah. baffling to it, me it is better than the original the justice league it is much better movie they flesh out the characters my opinion is it's a four hour long movie if they would have cut out any, all of the slow-mo it would have been an hour long movie <laughs> <laughs> because every time there's a fight it goes into slow-mo and i'm like okay there's using slow-mo and then there's abusing slow-mo <laughs> this is abusing slow-mo yes, like it, yeah. when you reach double digit percentage points that's that's probably oh, abuse i feel like you know it, you should probably never have more than three percent of your film in slow-mo like, well, in the, the I know it from the post side, like the cost of that, like all that, because when you do slow mo, that's not, you know, like you're not seeing those particles in real time. Those are all post work. Mm -hmm. All of that's post work. In fact, a lot of the movement of the character, like the people are sometimes even, you know, painted frame by frame in post. And so, like, I'm like, the amount of money they would have spent on that slow mo when they could have done it in real time with a tiny bit of slow mo. And still looked as cool, if not better, <laughs> you know, like, it's like, oh, I just like, I've seen those money drops from the other side of it. You know, like, I know how much money they fork out for those things. And it's, it's ridiculous, ridiculous sometimes. <laughs> are there any films? Something that didn't need to be there. <laughs> are there any films that, that you've seen uh, in the past couple of years that struck you as just this one did it right, that this one was really good for uh, compositing and for visual effects and it was really clean and just impressed you. Godzilla vs. Kong was really good. Oh, really? Um, it was pretty... I mean, I think it was ILM, so I'm not that surprised mm. by it. I, I have um, not actually seen uh, Godzilla vs. Kong yet, but uh, even I'm familiar with it, ILM. Yeah, and I mean, they're, if you're going to get somebody who's going to do pretty much flawless CG, it's them. And, you know, there's there's... You're not gonna ever see a foot slip or something like that usually with their stuff because they're. And I have friends that work there for ILM on those movies, and you know they're so nitpicky that you're never gonna see anything like that. But 
you know, there's still points where I'm like, I would have probably done that a little different or maybe just not had a billion lens flares in the scene to try to hide something that was wrong. But, uh, you know, like uh, it's still like that movie was pretty flawless overall. I mean, story story aside, I mean, like I said, I'm pretty easy to please. The story was pretty simple. But man, it had that monster fights that you wanted, like <laughs> that everybody wants, you know, like yeah, it was just everything like everything I've heard. Like I said, I haven't seen it myself, but everything I've heard is just it's good, stupid fun and you get what you came for. Well, in that first one that they made, the first American made Godzilla movie or whatever, not maybe not the first one, but the second, where like Godzilla didn't show up till 75% of the movie was done. And then he was like in a smoke cloud in the city. You're yeah, like, that was the first you know, one. That's not what people wanted. Yeah, they, they don't, they wanted Godzilla to be at least 75% of the movie. Yeah, and this the, one and, got and it right. And that's really the like, difference of, I think, because in the original Japanese productions of Godzilla, Godzilla is a human film. It is about the people. It is about just sort of war technology and society yeah. and handling of crises because Godzilla himself was initially an analogy for nuclear warfare. Uh, oh, but, yeah. but nowadays, and especially in the Western markets, Godzilla is meant to be just good old rock'em sock'em monster bash. And, and that's what and, and people that's wanted, fun. right? Yeah, yeah that, that's fine. It's what people wanted, fight. but it felt yeah. like the first half of the, I think it was 2014 Godzilla, the first one that mm -hmm. was actually done by uh, Legendary, was trying yeah. to be more of a uh, Japanese yeah. homage film to Godzilla, and to that uh, to that end, I felt it was successful. Mm -hmm. I thought it wasn't bad, but I could definitely detect as a audience member. This isn't necessarily what I came to see, even if what I'm seeing is still good. Yeah, this one is definitely catering to what people have been asking for. I mean, there's there's giant fights in the ocean, like which you never guess, you know, like and there's the city fights and everything you want from a big monster thing where they're just yelling, you know, they're screaming and doing the Godzilla roar at each other. And you're just like, yes, yeah. yes. Gotcha. And, and from what little it. I know of visual effects, Doing a scene in water is one of the most difficult things because water, ha not only are you having to worry about the movement of these giant CG monsters, but you're also having to account for how does the water move around them. Oh, yeah. Well, there's also like filmmaking. So, like, one thing I'm picky on is uh, camera placement, stuff like that. There's like, I don't know, have you ever heard the rule of thirds? Yes. Um, okay, so yeah, the rule of thirds for anybody doesn't know is that you you don't put a character in the middle of the screen, basically. You put them towards the left or to the right and facing inward uh, because it draws the eye in. So the rule of thirds is you never just have somebody sitting in the middle. They only do that if it's some special case like the Michael Bay spin arounds or something, right? Where you want them in the middle because it's not, it's more about the camera pan. And, uh, and there's a lot of movies that do that or they'll break the, the line of sight, you know, like they'll swap the camera to the other side of them and it's not in the same angle where you're basically trying to do a parallel angle to it, you know, and that's not how a normal person sees. So like that kind of stuff really bugs me when movies do that. And this movie did a very good job, even with the crazy cameras movements, because you're literally having Kong and Godzilla wrestling on a air, aircraft cruiser in the middle of the ocean, you know, like you're just like, and they, and they're, you know, rolling in the water and going back and forth. And you're like, I'm like, they didn't break the rules at all. You know, even doing these action scenes. And I was like, it's, you didn't ever have to think what's going on. You know, like, I don't know what's happening right now. It's like, it followed and it was really good. So mm -hmm. I recommend that movie. It was really good. It was worth, worth the, uh, you know, HBO Max subscription that my brother pays, so. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever considered having Captain Krabs do, like, whether it be reactions or commentary of this type for, I don't know, trailers? I'm sure you can't, you know, broadcast a full film or anything via Twitch, just, you know, DMCA, but you could do yeah. probably an analysis of, you know, specific scenes or something to that end because... Uh, I don't know necessarily about your broader audience, but I find this stuff fascinating. It's obviously something that you're very passionate about yourself and very knowledgeable about. Yeah, I actually, when I ask people like, what else would you like to see, especially on my YouTube, because I don't know what to do with my YouTube. Um, a lot of times, uh, like now I'm just releasing like a gameplay video once a week. Captain Krabs um, reacts, let's go. Yeah, that's actually been one thing people keep bringing up because they, they always see how passionate I get when I get into a subject and how much I can rant on it. But um, 
I haven't done it yet. <laughs> I just haven't gotten around to it. It's been it's been hard enough juggling my time now that I'm like, ah, I really want to do more with YouTube, but I don't know. I mean, reacting to trailers would probably be the easiest thing for me to do um, because it's short, yeah. short content. You know, and, like and reacting to a whole movie. Get DMCA'd. Yeah, I still could get a claim on it, but uh, you know, there's ways around that. Um, but uh, that may be something I'll do. Uh, you know, it's also hard for me to not just want to watch a trailer the minute I know it's out. <laughs> so, Very fair. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely would that's something i've been interested in if people wanted to watch it i'd probably try that i mean i don't i people have said do reaction videos and i'm like of what you know like movie trailers i could see but like other than that i don't really know what yeah, i react or maybe to so like i said maybe it's not necessarily a reaction but maybe it's an analysis so you can still watch the trailers when uh, yeah. they first come out and you can enjoy them and you can digest them and then you do the video recording of after you've seen it and enjoyed it uh as you normally would and break things down yeah yeah i could probably do that in one video to be honest like a reaction and then like kind of jump back while, oh, yeah. while i'm like in the moment yeah why not have know? both <laughs> yeah um <laughs> that'd probably be the easiest way for me to do it um yeah maybe something i could do in the future I, I definitely need more uses for my youtube videos uh right now because that's the one thing i have i feel like i've had the weakest uh push for uh, myself, because I've been focusing on the Twitch stuff and yeah. and my shop and all that well, stuff. To be so fair, it's been you, like you've, you've been uh, busy with a lot of things, and uh, given the Iron Mouse raids recently, it makes sense that you <laughs> would focus on Twitch because you know when you're when you're gifted as many viewers as Iron Mouse brings along, uh, yeah, you you should run with it. So it makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's kind of. It's kind of crazy with that. I, I don't know. I mean, more content is always good. It's just time. You know, like I do work uh, 40 hours a week. Um, when I get off work, it's like dinner and kids until they go to bed, yeah. which is like 8, 830. And then I stream at nine. Um, and so it's been, you know, like in the DJ nights are very exhausting oh, uh, of all the nights. Um, it's not. It's not that I'm physically having to move that much because I'm actually sitting to DJ now instead of standing, I mean, which I used to do. It's still straining just in it's, terms of like mental activity that you need to be paying attention and running and just oh, yeah. on this whole time. Well, and like, you know, it's a, it's a lot of things because now I'm basically puppeteering at the same time. So <laughs> it's like, you know, like and my, my claws go up when my eyebrows go up. So I have to juggle them when I want to wave, you know, glow sticks around. I'm like... It looks really funny. If you guys want to see what it looks like when I'm DJing, uh, check out my TikTok. There's a video on there called like VTubing in real life or something like that. VTubing versus real life. And uh, it shows me doing the DJing and then it flips to my face. Uh, <laughs> if you don't want to see what I actually look like in real life, don't watch my TikTok video. <laughs> ah, <laughs> breaking up immersion. Break that immersion. Yeah. So it's a, but that's a, it's, it, that's not as tiring, but I, the way I DJ is different than a lot of people. A lot of people make playlists and then they just go song by song by song and they have them all pre-set up, you know, like this is my playlist for the night. I don't do that. I I learned by do like I said, I learned by doing. So what I do is I, when I start the stream, I just find two songs to start the stream with before the stream starts that can go into each other, like their same BPM or, you know, key. And then I literally find the next song as a song is playing. Yeah, the, so, and you, you've said on stream that, oh, I need to find something, or does anyone have suggestions? You do it all just to, you know, impromptu. Yeah, while while trying to interact with chat, while trying to animate <laughs> my character and dance them around, you know, trigger stuff. Uh, it really is impressive manage. how many plates you juggle when you stream. I'm, I'm using across three computers while doing it. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's something. <laughs> hey, that, that's that gotta be know. a good skill for something. And like, who knows, maybe there'll be a time somewhere down the line where you're able to figure out for one of the companies you're working with, okay, we can have a mascot and I can, you know, create this technology for you because you would just be adapting it from what you have on Captain Krabs. Not necessarily that you would even be the character yourself, but... Who knows where this could eventually go, and especially as more companies start to, you know, dip their toes into the VTubing pool, uh, I would not be surprised to see, you know, VTuber mascots 
for well, game companies I've potentially. actually suggested it uh to the company i'm at now uh because the community people weren't super thrilled about being on camera and i'm like hey if, if you want to get didn't somebody have to draw to. it i could rig it up for you like if you hey. want to you know get, get somebody on the art team to draw it, that's going to draw a much nicer looking realistic human. oh yeah and, and, and like i can I'll sympathize with that because i my start in gaming <laughs> was as a community manager and i never yep. even had to show my face fortunately um i think i showed it once when i did a video call with a few of like it our vip community members and a couple of influencers but that was a private thing and no one ever yep. saw my face outside of that so i know and can completely sympathize with community managers wanting to keep their privacy and especially when they're working at a bigger company the idea oh, yeah. of putting your face out there is extremely daunting so i mm -hmm. would not be surprised to see vtubing actually become sort of a tool for community managers i certainly think that it's a logical one Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, and, and that's the thing. They're like, well, that's a good idea. I'm like, yeah, it's not that hard. I mean, you just need a web cam and a, there's free programs. Like, I mean, it's not that complicated. It's just, you know, and I don't mind rigging it on, on, you know, on the clock. <laughs> it's yeah. fine. You know, I've rigged up enough of these now I can do it, you know? Um, but, uh, it's, you know, it's, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. But, um, but yeah, it's, you know, like I, I'm always about new technology and stuff and learning new stuff. So like, I like to test my brain and keep it functioning, you know, like even with After Effects stuff, you know, I'm always like, oh, there's a new plugin. I need to learn this plugin or I need to figure out how to do this. So I always give myself a challenge, like the anime intro. That was a challenge. I was like, oh, I've never written a song before. I'm going to write a song. You know, I, I was like, I can write a jingle, you know, like a like a like an anime opening. They're not that complicated. And, you know, and I had to find people to sing it and and, uh, you know, do the music part of it because I didn't have the time to try to figure that out. Um, but then, you know, like I was like, I'll like animate on stream. They'll give me something to do, you know, and and so I had to rig all the characters in After Effects so I could animate them. I had to do all of the effects work, the particles, the compositing, come up with ideas. It was like a three month process to get, get that done. Um, but uh you know it was fun to me you know stressful but fun <laughs> yeah and it was it's a really unique thing that um a lot of people have you know they're going live streams but very few have their own proper you know intro songs and uh, we were playing it just before we went live this evening on a loop and uh if you go to captain cab captain crabs's stream you can actually do a channel point redeem to get that uh, intro played and uh, it's a really cool one yeah, they, I, people actually look forward to it before the stream starts. So like I'm on the slow like loading screen. Yeah. And people just start yelling crabs, crabs, crabs because they know that video is coming. They just <laughs> love the crabs part. Uh, it's funny because in the original cut, when we first recorded it, it didn't say crabs. It said, I, 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 because it's supposed to be a pirate. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I got this guy to be a pirate and he recorded it. And then uh, I said, well, let, can you record it as crabs, crabs, crabs? And uh, so we had like, I had the, the main singer. She, I got her to record a few different lines because I had two different scripts. And then I also got this background vocal guy that was doing the pirate voice to do multiple different lines on some stuff because I wanted to see what it sounds like. So technically I have another version where it ends with, uh, instead of sailing the seas, it's a, it just yells, Captain Crabs. Release the crabs like, cut. Yeah, and then the the ending where it's like, ha ha, I like crabs. The guy just winged it, <laughs> and he just he gave me a bunch of extra recordings. He's like, I just had fun, you know, putting this bunch of stuff, and I was like, oh, I love it. So I'm like, that's going right that's in there. Great. Like, it's such a great <laughs> ending. Yeah, and and I used a bunch of his stuff, and I actually hired him to do a bunch of voice recordings for my character, Mr. Pebbles, who's one of my alerts when people follow and stuff like that. Mm. Also, I have some DJ drops where he's like. He says, here comes the crabs and, you know, this bass brings a smile to me face and stuff like that. You know, like I have all these like ones I can trigger when I DJ of all the characters. So, but uh, I don't know, it's fun. It was fun. And then, you know, it was a nice challenge. I like to put myself out with something new, you know, like the book. I'd never written a book before. I never thought I was a very good writer. Um, and I was like, I've never illustrated a book. So I'm yeah, like, so I want to make, make a book. Let, let me bring us to a different screen where I have your book it is captain crabs a friendly pirate adventure <laughs> yep so it you were the one that actually one. wrote this i wrote it and illustrated it yep 
did the whole thing actually um so we're publish it <laughs> so when did the idea come about of all things to do a children's book um it actually had been something in my head for at least a year because like every night you know like i have a four and a six year old and we just read them bedtime stories you know mm. different books and so i was like well you know like when i started making captain crabs i'm like oh you know what i can make more characters and i was like really getting into illustrator to draw like vector shapes because that uh, captain crabs is in vector um and you know not like and i was like oh i can make some cool looking chibi characters that go with them so i started making characters and then i was like you know i keep just like the movies i start tearing these books apart these kids books <laughs> like oh well this isn't this isn't that hard to write i could write a book like this you know for you know, third grade re reading level, you know, like I'm not going to write a novel, but like we're, you know, I can do this. Yeah. And I was like, cause it's more about the graphics and like keeping the kids attention. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I could do this. Cause I, it's like, I know what's good and what's not good in these books. I can see what my kids react yeah, to. Certainly. Know? Yeah. You have a test audience built in. Yeah. And they love Captain Krabs. In fact, unfortunately I've had to read this book to my son for a month and a half every single night. <laughs> so He's got his Captain Krabs plushie with him too. Oh so, my gosh, that's them, great. so, um, yeah. So <laughs> it's a, uh, you know, like I'm not sick of it, but <laughs> you know, like, like reading like anything for a month on loop yeah. will wear you thin. Doesn't matter if it's your own book or Shakespeare. And I have 15 other ideas for books, but I have one that's flushed out. That's going to be my second book, but Ooh. I haven't found time to do the art for it. Mm. So like I have most of it written, like the overarching story, but it's a lot more interactive than this book. Oh, um, so it's going to be really fun for kids. Maybe maybe adults won't get into it as much because it's going to be like, you know, stuff like, hey, you need to shake the book or you need to blow on the book. You know, like it's interactive. Oh, wow. So it's um, going to have like the sort of built in things of when you shake it that, you know, some image will show up or that you'll have, I guess, I don't know. It'll heat still be pictures stuff. like this because the way I can pu publish it. I wish I could do heat embedded stuff, but um, it's going to be more. Uh, there's a book called Don't Push That Button. Have you ever seen that book? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I have not. Have if you don't have kids, you probably haven't seen the book. If you have kids, you probably have seen the book. Um, it's basically a book where there's a button on every page and the guy tells a story and he's talking to the audience and he's like, but don't push that don't, button. Don't push that button. Right? <laughs> oh and gosh, and goodness knows with kids, the minute you yep. say don't do this. Yeah, like you there's like a Christmas version of it. And like, <laughs> then you switch the page and something happened because they pushed the button, right? That's the whole point so, of that. So but, are there different outcomes is this a choose your own adventure book where if the child pushes nope. the button that you go to one page and if they don't push the button you go to another it's not that complicated ah. trust me this is like for <laughs> like we're talking third four, three or four year old reader level kind of thing mm. but they love it they get super into it you know like and it's like there's like a scene on one of the the christmas one where like there's a whole bunch of elves and on the screen because you're trying to I don't know, it's almost like you're trying to steal Santa's sleigh, but, and, and they're like, he's like, quick, shake the book, you know, like, let's get rid of the elves and you shake the book and then you go to the next page and he goes, oh no, it started snowing because you shook too hard. Uh, you know, it's like, it's interactive in that yeah, sense. Like, okay, it's all I get the same it, yeah. story, but I had an idea to do something like that. I don't want to spoil what it's about, but of course, it, of course, it might be a little different than that, but it's in that same idea where it's like interactive that what they do affects the next page, um, even though it's actually always the same. Mm -hmm. because it's a you know it's just a normal book yeah, it's just but it, it, it's but also kids, an instruction it, manual yeah they thrive on that and when the character interacts with the audience it's even more you know like For sure just, yeah kids love it they no, love it cool. and I, I find captain krabs is that kind of character where like one of my goals was to do shorts at least like animated shorts with him on youtube or, but like I said, I'm not the. I don't consider myself the greatest writer. So coming up with ideas for well, that's honestly, cool stuff. the little things that you've posted online of just you know Captain Krabs hanging in his quote unquote hot tub, or just the little <laughs> one you did with the Iron Mouse one today. That even if it's not something that's being written, I think you're really good at being able to just sort of create small little fun clips of just Captain Krabs in his daily life. Yeah, those are usually like like I said on the like spawn of something something triggers it like i can tell you what triggered the hot tub one i was watching like a lot of times i'll either have twitch streams up or youtube while i'm working that's one nice thing about working in the games is that you know like i and since i've been video editing for so long i know how to focus my brain on one thing or the other 
so I can leave videos up running on one screen while editing on the other screen and listening to the edit. So, um, but I usually leave like I lately a lot of YouTuber stuff up and a uh, project Miko came up and she was doing her hot tub stream. And, uh, and she was doing a hot tub stream with an, I can't remember some guy and another girl that's really popular. Um, oh man, what's her name? She's very popular, but she's very popular for the wrong reasons. Um, she has, um, some assets that people love <laughs> and she and she was doing a hot tub stream uh anyways so i was like why are they all in hot tubs like what is going on because i know twitch has these rules about you know you can't be in like your underwear basically well there is a loophole to that where you can do in real life streams in the pool and be in a bikini so all these youtube or all these twitch streamers are doing hot tub streams where they call them hot tubs when they're just inflatable pools in their house <laughs> and that, that way they can be in their bikini and get a whole bunch of views so huh. I, I started researching into it i was like oh i want to know what this hot tub thing is and i found it was like trending on on twit or twitter and like it's actually a thing right now where all these streams are doing hot tubs stream. even if it's like just some in an inflatable pool or kiddie pool in their living room they're like in their you know swimwear um because they can get away with it because it's not against the tos uh, yep. of twitch <laughs> yeah uh, people will always find the loopholes yep and they get a lot of views for it and and i was like oh man that's so funny i'm like oh i could do a hot tub stream like how could i do a hot tub stream and i was like yeah, since everyone wants to start to eat me all the time, <laughs> I get a lot of Twitter <laughs> posts about people saying how tasty I look. I'm like, I'm going to make a, I'm going to just play it off and make a pot, a boiling pot and like, you know, just pretend it does, you know, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, and, no, you, you've been mentioning and I did it in like an hour. And, the, the, and then, the man in yeah. the, it was the friendly man in the white hat who told you that uh, he'll be right back <laughs> with uh, yeah. some bath salts or not bath salts, um, uh, bath bombs. <laughs> Yep, made that up on the fly. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was like, oh, I'm just gonna wing it, you know. Like I'm, I love doing that kind of stuff, you know, like just playing it off and playing dumb, and and I, I love that scene. So I was like, I made it in about an hour, I think it was about an hour to make that, and and uh, and then I was like, oh, and then I just ended up streaming that night, even though it was a day off, because I just wanted to wanted show to, everybody you know, the take it for a test and, drive. Yeah. Yeah, and then we ended up DJing in the end, and last night we ended up DJing in the hot tub. For half the stream, I actually just pulled my my virtual DJ board into the hot tub, yeah. and we were DJing in the hot tub. Yes, uh, I remember that. But, uh, Everyone was concerned. It was like, wait a minute, electronics and water? No. I just like anything interactive. Like, I actually have ideas for that scene to add where you can actually trigger by commands in chat different things happening in the scene. Yeah. Um, I've done that before with my pirate ship one where you can fire the cannons, but I, I have lots of ideas, it's just time consuming. So like, uh, I was like, oh, you could have a hand come in that, you know, put salt into the water or, you know, vegetables drop from the top or I can even integrate that. Like if somebody donated bits, it drops, you know, like bits into the water, <laughs> you know, you could do anything with it. Can, so and these I was are the like, types oh. of things that just, if you get these animations, you could potentially end up like selling these asset bundles and just sort of have, because it obviously not all of them are necessarily going to translate, but if it's something yeah. of just a generic bit dropping animation, that's something that really any VTuber or any streamer for that matter could really use. So uh, it, it'll be interesting mm -hmm. to see like maybe someday getting added to the Captain Crab's treasury, you start having, you know, these, uh, uh, stream resources it's it's actually funny you say that because when we launched the site that was actually one of the things on the site i actually was uh, i put a whole bunch of um different overlays and stuff that you could buy um that i had created in the past um but i ended up taking them down uh i don't remember why i think it was just nobody was nobody was really buying them uh, i had them up for super cheap too like three bucks but um but there were a lot of overlays and different stuff i think they were just very specific because they were a lot of the overlays i had made for myself in mm -hmm. the past yeah um so i think and they weren't really catered to the vtuber community per se you know they were like explosions and and stuff like that yeah. too um but i think if i may if i had the time to sit down and make vtuber specific ones they'd probably be a lot more popular yeah <laughs> so now one thing i know that did sell well is something i have up here on stream right now it is the captain crab's plushie yeah it was a it was an interesting thing because we always like we're like, man, he would make a really yeah, cute this, plushie. It just, this seems like it was an inevitability, for sure. 
Yeah, we started looking into it and it, we had to do a lot of research. It, like I asked a few other VTubers that have stores that had sold plushies before. Um, there's there's some that are, they kind of VTube on the side and they also run the store for, that's what they do for a living. And they had made plushies and talked to a few of them how they got plushies. And and uh, we didn't realize how expensive it is to front the cost of making plushies. So we did like a, I think it was supposed to be a, a 20 plushie run originally. Um, and then, uh, it wasn't like they were kind of selling like we sold a few of them but since we didn't actually have a physical prototype yet like nobody knew what it was going to look like so once we got that prototype we sold out in a day yeah so like once we had a see picture it and look of them at thing, it's yeah. adorable yeah and then so we ended up a lot of people started contacting me saying hey I didn't, I didn't get it. I was still saving up for it or I was waiting for a payday, blah, 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 you know? And uh, so I'm like, okay, we'll extend it. So we extended it to 50 because it was still being produced. So we're like, can we add 30 more? Um, and uh, and so we're like, okay, we're gonna take more pre-orders, but we ended up selling out uh, of all 50, which is kind of crazy. A lot of them sold with the book bundle too. That was actually kind of cool. Like people actually wanted to buy it because they give it to their nephews or nieces. Yeah, it makes you um, good birthday present, <laughs> holiday present kids love having a plushie with a book you know oh, like yeah. they can relate the two so it's the um, just that that full experience and being able to have it in multiple ways that's in my opinion one of the biggest successes of the pokemon franchise wrapping things back for a second of just what made pokemon such lightning in a bottle was it wasn't just a game it was also an anime it was also trading cards it was also books it, like pokemania mm -hmm. and just all the merchandising they did the fact that you could really just live this Pokemon lifestyle and have it be on, like, you know, your bed sheets, and uh, you could get a yeah. Pokemon lunchbox. Uh, it definitely goes a long way from the marketing and just from the fun standpoint of, hey, yeah, I like Captain Krabs. I want to have him in more than one place. Actually, it's funny. We actually just sold the first blanket, Captain Krabs blanket. I last saw night. that in the shop. I don't have an uh, uh, an image handy for it, but it looked very soft and fluffy. Yeah, it's super, uh, the plushie is super, super fluffy and soft, and it's like eight inch. We actually went a little bigger than, like, normal people do, like, a four to five inch plushie, <laughs> like a small little one. I'm like, I want this thing to be big, you know, like, <laughs> supposed to be almost nine inches originally, but then it ended up after they made it, it was about, you know, eight. But, uh, <clears throat> and I've wanted to do other characters, too. We've been in talks to try to do other characters, but, um, but yeah, we we just put them back up for pre-order the plushies because we we ordered another bundle of them. Mm. Um, so we should have a lot more. But our goal also was to um, eventually now, once the COVID thing clears up, we're going to actually start doing conventions. Oh, and, very and have nice. Plushies and stickers and all these things. I want to go to the Captain you know. Krabs booth. Yeah, that's Heck, that's and, the and plan. What you do is, like, I mean, try next year, that's the and goal. Try and get a a thing with the convention where it's like, okay, I will come and I will DJ your rave, and in exchange, you give me <laughs> the booth space for free and potentially That'd other be benefits. Great. But like, you negotiate it all together in a package. Um, I actually have done a lot of work for conventions and also for industry at conventions. Mm -hmm. Um, it varies by convention, and I don't know. Oh, yeah. If many do this nowadays, but sometimes what conventions will do, usually not the smaller ones because they need cash, but depending on yeah. larger ones, I've heard of instances where uh, a company can sort of barter to have a portion of booth cost or some other cost that would go to the convention subsidized by merchandise and saying, okay, I will give you double the value in MSRP mm -hmm. for merchandise. So uh, I will give you $200 of merch and you take $100 off of my bill. But for you, yeah. you're not giving $200 of merch because you're only losing what is the production cost. So you could end up mm -hmm. actually giving out less than $100 and that way it's a win-win on both sides. Yeah, speaking about convention related stuff, we actually have some lanyards coming in soon. Ooh, uh, oh man, I can't wait to. to uh, how I long to wear a lanyard again. I, I collect lanyards, so I have a few hundred lanyards oh, from wow. the different conventions I've been to. Um, I used to. It's it's kind of an industry thing in marketing. Yeah. Marketing people start collecting. You know, like I learned it from my marketing manager at Bioware originally. Uh, he had like this huge collection of lanyards hanging on the back of his chair, and I'm like, why do you have so many? He goes, Well, I get one at every convention. And, yep, that's uh, your and memento. I started, yeah, I started doing the same thing, you know, like I collect the one from the convention, but then I also will try to 
create or do other things with developers to get their current ones. Mm, I have like a yeah, Sonic yeah. the Hedgehog one from Sonic CD when they re-released it. You know, stuff like that, like really hard to get ones. Um, and so I was like, now I'm gonna have a Captain Krabs one. I'm so excited. Yeah, I, I remember my, I have not been able to trade for too many things, but I still will always remember I was working, um, it was San Diego Comic-Con this one time, and it was the last day of the show. The hall had just closed up, and I forget which com which company makes the Hitman series. I can't recall it off the top of my head. Um, I'm just totally oh. blanking. But anyways, yeah, the, the, the company that makes the Hitman series, one of their folks yeah. came by carrying a bunch of ties because Hitman wears this, you know, iconic red tie yeah. that they had been giving out, and they were like, hey, do you have anything that you would want to trade for some ties? And unfortunately, we had given away all of our, you know, higher-end giveaway items. Oh, uh, thank you, Gamer Blue Stream Ubisoft. It's Ubisoft that does the Hitman series. Yes. Um, but then the convention manager said, you know, we do have some tasty cakes in the back room, and you can't get them here in California because it, it was <laughs> a company from out of state. And the uh, Ubisoft guy was like, oh, my gosh, we would just love some Tasty Cakes over at our booth. So we traded Tasty Cakes for ties, and I still have that just, you know, <laughs> really nice silk red Hitman tie that I still wear from time to time because it is just nice. a plain red tie. But on the back, it has the little Hitman logo. So, uh, oh, yeah. yeah, that that's probably just the best merch trade that you're ever going to get. <laughs> I think the only two, the two biggest ones I ever got that I I thought was cool was, um, the, do you remember the MMO Ion or Aeon? I'm not sure how you're supposed to say uh, it. Rings the, of Bell, the, yes. It was like about like, they had like big old angel wings. Uh, it's Korean one. They, they had a booth and they had these just amazing looking shirts. They were like these dark blue shirts with white and it had like all this just really detailed art and it was a, it was a all over print on these shirts and it was just the employee shirts mm. and on the last day i was like i will trade you a bunch of star wars Republic public shirts like i'll give you like 20 of them because the whole thing is you know like nobody wants to br pay to ship oh, those yeah, back that, so they just get nobody them wants to pay shipping costs for back home <laughs> it's it's not worth it you just get it get rid of the shirts yeah. and so like i was like i'll give you like 20 shirts if you give me one of your dev shirts and sure enough the guy gave me one of his brand new dev shirts and i still have that shirt and i love that yeah. shirt it's so cool um the only other thing i got was um we were sharing a booth with LucasArts uh, when before Star Wars Old Republic even came out. It was like the year before, because um, you know, like LucasArts when LucasArts was still a thing, and they were they had just done the remasters of. Um, oh man, what was the name of that game with Guy Burst Threepwood? Uh, the Pirates game, the old old LucasArts uh, Pirates games. Uh, I can't think of the name. Tales of, them. of Monkey Island. Was yes, that, that. I think it was they, they did the remasters of those um, where they dupped the art and stuff like that. Mm. And they were giving out just to because they were getting press tours, right? And uh, to, to just high level press, they had these miniature voodoo dolls of Guybrush Threepwood that were in the second game, I think. Oh. And if you and if you squeezed them, they talked. Ooh. And and they gave me one of those the last day. I was like, they had two left, and I'm like. Can me and there was another I had another video editor on my team it was there I'm like Can we have these last two and they're like I don't know they're supposed to be for VIPs and like uh what can I give you something else for it and they're like all right just take them so I got them I'm like <laughs> ah, nobody got these and they only had like maybe 50 of these things total I still have it I love it it's just so cool because yeah. it was something that was like super super rare mm -hmm. yeah but... no, just from working conventions you stop buying normal merch and you look for the unique you look for the different things because you know just you end up collecting the lanyards because that is your memento that i have yeah. the lanyard and badge of every convention i have ever worked mm -hmm. but and for like the first five or six i bought a single piece of like merch or something from somewhere in the dealer's hall usually something small to keep as a memento but even after just a year i was just like i can't keep doing this and I honestly don't feel the drive to and the lanyard's enough but it's the type of thing that you keep your eye out for is there something like particular and special or is there this mm -hmm. opportunity to trade because it's cool on your end as well because then you know all right for how special that voodoo doll is to you or how special that shirt is to you someone else hopefully if you're able to trade 
cherishes whatever it is that you had because it's that difference mm -hmm. of, all right, this is something that is either like rare or coveted or that technically wasn't available to the public. So it's it's a give and take of being able to, you know, share that with other people that work the convention. Oh yeah, when I and then I went to so many uh, E3s and PAXs, is basically is what the two I went to. I, I also worked one San Diego Comic Con that was rough, uh, but uh, it was uh, I would start flying out with an empty suitcase because I knew I would get so much extra swag mm. that I would bring it back to give to the office because like at the last day, you know, like Nintendo yeah. dropped twenty shirts in our booth, just left them there before we even got to the booth because they were trying to get rid of shirts. <laughs> they were just dumping piles of shirts in everyone's booth. That's great. Basically, like take them, you know, or throw them out because we're not. <laughs> keeping them and so like i'd bring those back to the office because we had 500 them. people at that office and you know like they they didn't get to go to the conventions like i did you know and so like and a lot of people didn't you know like a lot there's people that don't want to do those conventions because they're usually on a weekend mm -hmm. it means you have to work the entire weekend you know it's tiring for yeah. people but i i just thrive off oh of absolutely it. yeah that that is very much me that you and i i get feeling we are both very pure extroverts in that we yeah. are, we thrive on that. We get energy from doing things that are social with other people. And just for me, being in the middle of a busy convention floor is my idea of zen. Yes, I love it. I love, especially, especially, I wouldn't say E3 as much as PAX, because at PAX, if you're working on a game, the people there are the players, yeah, not yeah, rats. Yeah, that's and the so difference. And so they're excited mm -hmm, about yeah, it. Yeah, because there's so much more passion of just... Conventions are collections of happy, excited people. People mm -hmm. go to conventions to have fun. For some people, it is their vacation. It is their escape. It is something they look forward to for months. And yeah. just everyone is happy to be at a convention. If they're coming to your booth, they're excited because they want to check out your game. And it's just positive energy all around. Yeah, every so often you get just a jerk or two. But there's so many more people that are just there to have a good time. And for the mm -hmm. vast majority of them, they're good, polite people, and uh, there really is nothing like the energy of a convention that I've been able to find. And oh, honestly, yeah. that's I been one of the best part of this past year, just the fact that I couldn't yeah. do conventions. Well, like uh, when I was at Rooster Teeth, it was great. Like I was so tired all the time because we work 24 hours straight days. We work, you know, 16 hours on average, six days a week um on that show. They, we were just very overworked. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, like RTX was like, just the coolest thing ever because oh, yeah, like, it, and that's just different from any other one because it's not just a convention it is your convention yeah and there was forty thousand people there the last last one i went to i mean it was crazy and like everybody who works at rooster teeth is a rock star there it doesn't yeah. matter what you do oh for sure yeah you no, know, it's, if it you have like, a staff it, plan you're yeah. people want to talk to yeah. you uh Golex is asking about anime conventions. <laughs> yeah, so so anime conventions are my bread and butter. Um, yeah. I have worked a number of San Diego Comic Cons, and I think, yeah, I think other than San Diego Comic Con, ironically, all the conventions I've worked are anime conventions. There's like one random outlier, but most of my work has been in anime. And uh, yeah. How are anime conventions? It, honestly, the energy is largely the same to a comic convention. That uh, San Diego Comic Con, yeah. to me, does not feel any different from Anime Expo, except for the sense of scale and the specificity of the content. That it is still just happy people excited to see stuff that they are passionate about. I, I do have one opinion on anime conventions, though. Mm -hmm. the viewer base and the attendance base is a lot younger yes okay that, um, that is absolutely the, true and that's early 20s maybe or younger is majority of the people at yeah, anime I, cons i've noticed it actually getting a lot older lately but a comic conventions are still going to skew older simply because comics have been around in the west longer than anime has oh, yeah. that uh, generally speaking a I, I would say the average age if i had to just throw out a random guess i'd say the average age is probably now between 19 and 26 or something like it, it it's not early teens yep. anymore for the average but that's because mm -hmm. it used to be early teens about five ten years ago and those people have just grown yeah. up because anime you are absolutely True. correct has a younger fan base just because anime got to the west after comics 
Yeah, RTX because it had a lot of anime fans just because of Ruby. Yeah, uh, was a very mixed group. Mm -hmm. There was definitely older, but there was also a lot of younger. Whereas, like, if you want, if you're over thirty or thirty five and you want to cosplay, go to Dragon Con <laughs> because Dragon Con is definitely the adult. Yeah, well, convention. Dragon Con is known as adult <laughs> con for multiple reasons, and that's because it's yeah. also a drinking con. I mean, Peter Mayhew was sitting at the bar smoking a hookah that was definitely not tobacco, uh, <laughs> like the entire night. I mean, that Chewbacca was sitting That's at the bar incredible. smoking weed <laughs> at Dragon Con <laughs> when we went there, like the entire night, hanging out with people and drinking. It was, uh, you're like, yeah, this is Dragon Con, okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, I only got to go one year, but it was, it was, it was definitely interesting. So we don't have too much time because you mentioned that you have to get going by 10 p.m. Eastern. But uh, I guess just a couple last things. You've mentioned to me that in addition to the work you've done, you're also a member of the Star Wars 501st. So you've done conventions and just larger events for Star Wars. Oh, yeah. And like, uh, so are you someone who uh, cosplays along with it or are you someone who helps manage the operation? What do you do as a member of the 501st? So I am a uh, New Hope stunt stormtrooper which is my favorite stormtrooper the original like from the first movie mm. stormtrooper yeah yeah you know the ones that keep falling in the hallways and tripping oh. and oh uh, yeah hit their heads on the doors that 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 guy which i think is the most iconic stormtrooper in my opinion everyone yeah. knows it and uh and i wanted to do darth vader because i am tall enough for darth vader but he is insanely expensive to do you're talking a minimum five thousand dollars uh yeah well that, that makes sense if you're doing the quality that is demanded by the 501st has to be 100 percent movie accurate mm. or better so and like technically our armor actually is better than the original movies those were falling apart and breaking and they were throwing them out every night like oh, our wow. armor is made out of uh hips or, or abs plastic which is what car bumpers are made out of so they can take a hit they can bend you know for the most part anyways um uh, but it has to be movie accurate because lucasfilm can call us up at any time and use us if, we, if they want to yeah that that is the, um, the benefit and the hazard of the 501st yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and then, and then eventually, you know, they they actually registered as an as a as a charity, so or charity organization. So now, you know, like Lucasfilm really doesn't say anything about it, but they've always supported the five hundred first. You know, yeah, um, but it, it is known far and wide as the Star Wars cosplay fan group. Well, they finally used them in in the Mandalorian. So there was like eight, like what was it like 60, 60 501st people in that one scene in the first season of Mandalorian? I think it was. Um, are all 501st. Oh, I didn't and know they that. Came, they, basically, what they had was they had like 20 stormtroopers and 20 sets of armor, and they're like, we need more stormtroopers. Um, let's just call the 501st, because they knew the armor was going to be perfect. It was going to be, they'd have their own weapons. They'd look oh, like... Oh, gosh, so the they literally outsourced the work for their yes. costuming department because they knew and, the costuming department and, themselves wouldn't even have to bother buying it or creating it or fitting it because, you know, oh, those things yeah. need to be fitted and to the I wear they probably didn't even pay them to be honest i don't know i sure. could ask them actually sure. i used to trip with some of them out in california but they didn't tell them what it was and so well, that makes they sense just said, because hey, we're you know filming something <laughs> yeah well and then they, it could be a commercial so a lot of times when the five first gets called it's a commercial mm -hmm. some star wars toy or something and they need a stormtrooper in the background blah 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 yeah usually it's not a pay gig sometimes it is lucasfilm is the only one can pay us uh everyone else has to donate to charity mm. so um not that they do, but they they can pay you if they want to. Uh, it, not that that would stop anyone from showing up and doing it, anyways, right? Yeah. Like I did a I did a episode of Extreme Home Makeover. What? Uh, Wait, how does the Bible yeah. first fit into that? So the last ever filmed episode of Extreme Home Makeover before they rebrought it out recently, um, they was in uh, was it Bastrop in Bastrop, Texas, where the whole town basically burned down. And uh, one these family lost their house and the father lost his Star Wars collection. And they're like, uh, Lucasfilm's like, hey, we need some stormtroopers in Texas, you know, like Austin, whatever, to come do this shoot because they want stormtroopers in it. And it was gonna be a Christmas episode. We filmed it right in December. Uh, we were walking around this burned down forest and house and everything while they're rebuilding it. So they were, we were there for two days. The first day when they started building and the, the reveal um, with the family and for like 16 hours. And uh, and uh and then it didn't air for a year 
because they had to go through post oh, oh, yeah, stuff and it was it just, Christmas special. Yeah, and, and so broadcast like, things have a huge delay yeah. from when they actually hit the air. Well, it ended up being a two hour special and it was the last episode they aired of Extreme Home Makeover. Um, but I was in it like six times uh, because of the, like, I, for one, they were like, hey, we're gonna reveal the room to the kids. It was like a Star, Star Wars themed kids room. And uh, you know, they always have, the, if you ever watch show, the re big reveal is the, the one special room every time. And I was like, I'll do it. And one other guy's like, I'll do it. And I'm like, I, so I'm like, there's no way they'll cut it because it's the big reveal room. Yeah. It's going to be shown. Uh, and so we ended up, you know, like for sure, you know, like we walked the parents in there, like escorted them as stormtroopers, you know. And, oh gosh, that's so and cool. Dave Mira was the guest star there, the, the BMX biker. Mm -hmm. Um, although I didn't know it was him because he's so short. We took a picture <laughs> with him and all I could see was the green helmet because you can't look down on those helmets. Oh. And so I saw like the green worker helmet and he had a bike and I'm like, I don't know who that is. And then afterwards I saw the picture. I'm like, oh, it's Dave Mira. <laughs> like the Dave Mira from the video game <laughs> and the BMX biker. Uh, but, uh, you know, and then Ty Pennington and all those guys, um, you know, and we actually shot a, took a picture of Ty Pennington arm wrestling Darth Vader and with all of us as stormtroopers cheering him on and they use that as a promo picture. <laughs> That's great. But uh, it was really cool and I got to be on TV for that. And I did another Lucasfilm or LucasArts event, Lucasfilm, when uh, Clone Wars was airing, they were showing um, Clone Wars, uh, was I don't remember, I think it was the movie, the original when they combined the three episodes in a movie at the Egyptian theater, whereas, um, oh, sorry, they weren't showing it. They were showing M uh, Return of the, uh, Empire Strikes Back. So they were, it was during Clone Wars, they were promoting Clone Wars. They were showing Empire Strikes Back at the Egyptian theater. And it was the first time it had been in the Egyptian theater since it originally premiered in the Egyptian theater in Hollywood. Wow. So it was like, it was the anniversary, 25th anniversary or whatever it was. And uh, they're like, we need a bunch of stormtroopers to come out to Santa Monica. We're gonna put you in the back of an open limo and we're gonna drive around Hollywood and, and Beverly Hills. And then and inside the limo will be all the Clone Wars voice actors. And we're gonna party and then we're gonna, you know, you guys are gonna escort them as party troopers and, uh, and uh, you know, to the premiere. And so basically Lucasfilm bought us all kilts. Uh, <laughs> they bought us fla flask belt buckles. And so we're wearing like stormtrooper gear from the waist up. We're wearing stormtrooper boots and shin guards, but then we're just like bare legged <laughs> up to our kilts with these like uh, alcohol flasks. Oh my god! Is that even allowed? Like with the forest. branding, like are is is there allowed to be it, alcohol in Star Wars? Most it's, most it's places, Lucasfilm, so they can I, do whatever I, I they guess want. So yeah, yeah just, it, one thing I know for anime Lucasfilm. is like that they're very protective of the uh, the. Integrity isn't the right word, but just the the yeah. in universeness of their properties. Yes. But I suppose that it, that isn't quite as big a thing in uh, Western IP. Put it this way: when Kathleen Kennedy gives you a flask belt buckle, you, literally hands it to you, oh. you're like, "This is this oh. is okay." Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. So mm -hmm, she, mm -hmm. she was her event. So <laughs> that's this is before incredible. she was in charge. But uh, but yeah. So we like literally sat in the back of this limo. They gave us a ca like a whole case of beer. Um, oh my mind you, we can't drink it with the helmet on, but we were in the back of an open back limo, so the back was open. Yeah. And we just drove around Beverly Hills and stuff in rush hour traffic, like from Santa Monica from like 7 a.m. We drove around for a few hours till we got to the Egyptian Theater. People are like driving down behind us with their cameras out, yeah, like just in rush trying hour to snap a picture. Because like, even for as oh, absurd man. as Hollywood can be, that is not something you see every day. Yeah. And so this is the only time ever I made the front page of Reddit. For two days. Wow! There you go. <laughs> Playing the front page of Reddit for two days. I'm like, that's me. Captain Krabs uh, will make front page knows. Reddit someday. I'm sure of it. Oh yeah. Well, this was it, it was really fun though. Like, and then we got to watch the movie. You know, in the movie with all, and we got to hang out with all the Clone Wars voice actors, which is really cool. And there was a bunch of celebrities there. Um, you know, like uh, Sam Witwer was there, of course, but I met him like five times because he just he's everywhere. Um, but it, it was really neat. So. And then, uh, you know, we watched, we tried to watch the movie in armor, but it was just too un. Oh, yeah. Un no way, uh, no way. Uncomfortable, but. Hopefully, you were allowed like, to take your like helmets off for that. Exploded. Yeah, we took the helmets off, but we were going to try to sit in the armor. Yeah. But it was fun. And uh, that was the other Lucasfilm event it did. 
um besides like conventions those aren't usually lucasfilm sponsored you know like yeah. we just the 501st books a booth they usually give us the booths for free because we do charity for them mm -hmm. um and then you know i've done make-a-wish uh for make-a-wish kids we've done make-a-wish days i've even done a funeral for a make-a-wish kid where oh. i was a pallbearer in the stormtrooper armor oh, i'm not doing wow. that ever again that was too hard i uh, um, understandable wow but it made the the parents all yeah, they, the they parents wanted it and mm -hmm. it was it was great for them but with uh, almost everybody who did it was like we're not doing that again <laughs> yeah no, that was too hard yeah it's uh, like everybody was just happy we we're wearing helmets you know like and nobody oh, could see yeah. our faces because it was brutal oh, oh gosh but, i can only imagine yeah and you know like but you get to like, do a lot of fun stuff yeah. and the make-a-wish stuff's fun and mm -hmm. um you know it's good for the kids we do hospital visits and stuff like that obviously not done much or anything in the last year yeah. but um but uh, it's a, uh, you know, it's fun. It's a, uh, it's expensive to get into it because yeah. building the armor is not cheap. Mm. Um, and then you got to take care of it, you know. Um, yeah, just, the just upkeep of it all. Yeah, and you're not going to make money on it, so you got to think of it that way. Yeah, if you started is... taking money for it, mm -hmm. Lucasfilm could sue you. Not that they would, but they could. Yeah. Um, but it's fun. I mean, it was, it's nice, and I like doing charity stuff. So I want to do some charity streams someday. I just haven't figured out what to do and when. It's been just juggling everything. It's been tough enough. So I'm like, oh, I'm gonna do a charity stream. I just gotta figure it out. Somebody suggested I do one for like a, a wildlife or sea rescue. Oh yeah, that'd uh, be on brand. Might be a good idea. Yeah. So I'm like, well, yeah, it might be a good idea. I usually have always done charities for children's stuff, like child's play. Or, yeah. You know, stuff like that. Child's Even play, before I had kids. Um, um, uh, actual uh, life things of that sort. The Make a Wish directly. Uh, you know, some hospitals, child child hospital in Texas. A lot of times, St. Jude's. Stuff like that um but yeah i don't know we'll we'll see maybe future future thing awesome well i want to get my channel bigger before i do it so we actually can raise a decent yeah. amount of money which would be awesome so for sure well it is 10 o'clock and i am a man of my word you said that you need to go and goodness knows like as you said already you have a lot of things on your plate you just you work full time you're a father you are captain crabs among many other things so i want to make sure that uh <laughs> You were able to get some good sleep. Uh, Captain, I cannot thank you enough for being here this evening. This has been so, so much fun. I know we had a bit of a technical issue to work through at the beginning, but we got through it that uh, even if, sadly, we couldn't have you here in the flesh, so to speak, just having yeah. you here for a little bit of radio interview has still been such a delight. It feels like we were just scratching the surface, but I know that uh, this is the type of thing that you talk a bunch on stream, as you said, that you do interaction, you do it incredibly well. So I'm sure that not only I, but anyone in the audience who wants to know more about you needs to only go to your streams at twitch.tv slash Captain Crabs or Capt Crabs, C-A-P-T Crabs, and uh, that no. there will be many, many more stories where this came from. Uh, it has been so, so much fun. So thank you again, and thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight. Like I said, you can see... Uh, Captain Crabs on Twitch TV slash Capt Crabs, and you can also go to CaptCrabsTreasury.com to see his merch store. Uh, we had the plushie, there's the book, they have shirts, there was coasters, mugs, so <laughs> many things. That, like There was so much merch I wanted to talk about. We got on tangents, but they were fun tangents, so no regrets at all. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Captain. Uh, I'm going mm -hmm. to be sending us to one of our previous guests, actually, Tia. So... We're going to be letting the outro play through, and then we're going to be sending you on over. But once again, thank you all so much for tuning in tonight. I'm Jay. This is VTuber Talk. I'm here every week interviewing different VTubers and just having a good time. I hope you will join me again. And until next time, have a wonderful night, everybody. Bye.